Okay, so we spent a considerable time, um, a, a considerable amount of time to figure out what the solution of u x of t is. We said that, you know, u x of t can be separated into its two variables x and t and then we can find them to find out u. So we figured out what x of x was in the previous video. Um, but now we're going to find what t of t is and the good news is the method is entirely the same um, as x of x, okay? So, remember that any differential equation that has constant coefficients and it's equal to zero, the solutions are in the form of e to the exponent alpha x and you have to find out alpha. But the important thing to note is that the most general solution to these differential equations is a linear combination of all of the solutions which are in the form of e to the exponent alpha x, okay? So, in fact, you can have an n number of solutions, um, and in that case, the solution, the, the most general solution, would look like this, okay? It would just be a linear combination of all of the solutions. Um, you might forget where we're getting these c's, um, and basically, they just come from the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're experienced in math, uh, you would be able to solve these differential equations um, without the guesswork that we incorporated. Um, you know, people who are mathematicians have the tools to solve complex differential equations um, using very complex methods. Um, and if you, if you knew how to do that and you could solve these differential equations um, by those methods, you would find out that you would have to integrate these differential equations. Um, and whenever you integrate a differential equation, you end up getting a constant, right? You get an integration constant, and that's what these c's are. They're basically um, integration constants that you get um, from solving your differential equation, okay, manually. Now, moving on, to find t of t, let's figure out... Um, you know, what our parent equation is. And our parent equation was this. It might look a little bit different from the parent equation we had written before. You had a minus k here. Um, but then we said that, you know, k is equal to zero and k is a positive number. They give us trivial solutions. So the, so the answer was is that k is actually equal to negative beta squared. Um, and we figured out the value of beta in our previous video. Beta um, was actually equal to n pi over L, where L is how how much you stretch the string from your origin, okay? So, I'm going to rewrite this parent equation a little bit differently. I'm going to collect beta times V, um, and then I'm going to square that term, so I'm left with this. So, the only difference between this equation and you know, this equation and this equation is how I've written beta times v. Now, I want you to recall that beta is just equal to n pi over l, okay? Um, and I can also write beta in terms of n. I put an n subscript to tell me that the value of beta depends on n, okay? Um, l here is the constant. Remember, it was just the boundary of my string, okay? I could have a string in any form, but it's just that, you know, L is one boundary and zero is the other boundary. Now, consider this. I'm gonna call beta times V, I'm gonna give it a special name, omega. And if you recall, omega is just the angular velocity, okay? Um, if you don't want to remember the derivation I'm about to do, that's up to you, but I recommend that you listen to it so that you can understand why I chose to say that beta times v is equal to omega, okay? Um, you could just remember that beta times v, I'm, I'm calling it omega, but here's a more accurate version of why I'm calling it omega, so stick with me. Um, beta times v is equal to omega, and I said in the previous video that beta here is equal to n pi over L multiplied by velocity V. Now recall that velocity is equal to distance over time, right? Or time here is equal to distance over velocity. I just cross multiplied and I get this. Okay, now here my length is kind of like distance, right? If you started off from here and then you walked all the way up here, you would end up with L, right? So the distance that you cover, sorry, from here to here is L. 
Now, moving on from that, um, you know, I instead of calling it D, I could call it L. Okay, so um, if T can be written as L over V, then 1 over T can be written as V over L, right? I just took the reciprocal of both sides. Okay, now if 1 over T is equal to V over L, that means that this term here is equal to 1 over T. Okay. So, if that's equal to 1 over t, then recall that 1 over t is actually equal to frequency f. Okay? So, 1 over the period t is just equal to the frequency of a system. So, n pi times the frequency is equal to beta times velocity v n pi frequency is equal to omega. That's just the formula for the angular velocity um, of any object. Now, you could, so, you know, 2 pi f is what you're used to seeing, but it turns out that, you know, that 2 pi f comes from the fact that you do a one circle around, you do one lap around a circle, so that gives you an angle covered of 360 degrees. But you can, when you're, when you're revolving around in a circle, you can go around the circle how many ever times you want. So that's why I have an n, which is a more general case, um, rather than limiting it to 2 pi f, okay? So you have n pi f, or n pi nu, um, and that is equal to omega n. Now I say that omega here depends on n, how many ever times you go around the circle, right? The velocity is the same, um, it's just the amount of circles that you cover that's different. So omega here is equal to beta times velocity. So our parent equation can be written um, as a different way, a slightly different way, um, and that's instead of having beta times velocity, I have omega n. So now recall that such a solution has, such an equation has a solution in the form of e to the exponent of a t. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to replace t of t with e to the exponent of a t. When I do that and I do the math, I get this derivative being this guy, okay? And nothing happens over here. There's no operation going on. So... I can divide everything by e to the exponent of a t. When I do that, this guy disappears, this guy disappears. So, alpha squared plus omega n squared is equal to zero, which implies, so then you get something like this. Okay, so then you can square root both sides, and remember, the square root of a negative number is equal to i. The square root of omega n is just equal to omega n. Sorry, the square root of omega n squared is equal to omega n. So alpha is just positive negative i omega n. So remember, this means that you have two solutions, one in the form of i omega n and the other in the form of negative i omega n. But the most general solution is a linear combination of both of these. Okay? So that's where I get this general solution from. Okay, so this is the general solution in Cartesian coordinates. Remember, I always like to work in polar coordinates, so I'm going to use Euler's formula to convert this into polar coordinates. Now recall that Euler's formula is this. Um, in our case, theta, if you compare this guy and this guy, it becomes obvious that theta is just equal to omega n multiplied by t. So I'm going to use this formula, and whenever I see a theta, I'm going to replace it by omega and t. Okay, so that leaves me with the fact that t of t is equal to c3 cos omega n t plus c4 sine omega n t. Okay, we did a derivation like this about three times in the previous video, so you can go back and check them if you don't understand how I got from, you know, the Cartesian coordinates to the polar coordinates, um, but it's done about three, four times. If you don't understand, let me know. I'll, I'll do it again.
Now recall, um, we had a boundary condition for x of x. We know that the height of the string, um, or yeah, we know that the height of the string at the two extremes is zero. So the x component at the two extremes is also zero, but we don't really have any boundary conditions for time, okay? So because I don't have any boundary conditions for time, I'm just going to keep C3 and C4 as my constants. I really don't have any way to figure them out, okay? So C3 and C4 kind of seem awkward. We've been working with A's and B's, so I'm going to replace C3 with a D, and I'm going to replace a C4 with a E, okay? So T of T becomes this form then, where D and E represent the amplitudes of the waves. Now you could leave this um, with C3 and C4 if you really want it, um, but to maintain consistency I put it in the form of D and E. Finally, we can figure out that messy and that sneaky ux of t. It took a long time to figure it out, but now we can find what it is. So rem remember, when we use the method of separation of variables, we said that ux of t can be written as a multiplication of both of its variables, like this. Okay? So I know what x of x is, I know what t of t is. Um, x of x was equal to this guy, okay, and t of t is equal to this guy. So now I can go ahead and distribute the b inwards, um, and I'm left with this equation. So all I did is I distributed the b with the d and the e. So you know, I don't want to always write B, D, B, E, B, D, B, E. So instead of um, those two long names, I'm going to call B, D is equal to F, and I'm going to call B, E is equal to G. So finally, we know that U, X of T is equal to this long equation over here. But here's where the weird part comes, okay? So... Omega has a dependency on n, um, and there's an n over here. So that means that u also has a dependency on n. So u depends on x and t, but it also depends on n. For, for every different value of n, there's a different value of u. So... Since u depends on n, um, since I don't know any boundary conditions for t of t, that means f and g, the amplitude of the wave, also depends on n, right? The amplitude of the wave is just basically, you know, what's the height of the wave? As time goes by, the wave can evolve differently. The, the wave can look like something like this, or it could look, so it, at time is equal to 5 seconds, your wave could look like this. Then, if time is equal to 200 seconds, your wave may look something like this. At both of these instances, um, where n has a different value, the height, the amplitude of the wave is also different, okay? So, since the amplitude of the wave is different, um, we say that f and n, um, sorry, f and g also depend on n. So I rewrite the equation um, by putting in n's everywhere to show you that u depends on n and the amplitude depends on n as well. Okay, stay with me for a second. Remember, the solution, the most general solution to any um, linear differential equation is a combination of all of the solutions, right? Um, u n solves this partial differential equation, if you recall, it's du with respect to dx is equal to 1 over v squared d del squared u over del t squared, okay? So u x of t satisfies this equation, right? But this u is dependent on n. So that means for every n, there's a solution for this equation. Therefore, the most general solution is a linear combination of all of the solutions that correspond to u and x of t. Right? So, just like how f of x had many different solutions, 
um, and the most general solution was a linear combination of all of these solutions. Similarly, ux of t has many solutions um, that satisfy this equation, but the most general solution is a linear combination of all of these solutions. So that means ux of t can be written simply as u1 plus u2 plus u3 and so forth up until un. I don't write the constants here because I've also already counted for those constants with f and g. So it turns out that ux of t happens to be a sum, a linear combination of all of the u and x of t terms, okay? So the most general solution to the classical wave equation um, is a linear combination of all of these single solutions of you know u and x of t forms so this is kind of complicated but if you've been listening um, and you've been kind of figuring out the pattern to how solutions to a differential equation work then I guess it shouldn't be all that mind-boggling right um, so this is the most general solution to the classical wave equation and it's supposedly called a linear superposition of normal modes. So each u n x of t corresponds to something called a normal mode. We'll figure out what these normal modes are in the next video um, and we'll also figure out what this equation is telling us in the next video. But the point of the matter is, is whenever you have a string that's bound on two sides and then you create some disturbance in this string, it will evolve according to this equation, okay? So we'll figure out what that means in the next video, but for now, um, I hope you figured out how we derive this equation. This is really important, um, and it, it builds on very nicely to our discussion of the quantum mechanical wave equation, or the so-called Schrodinger wave equation.